Hello. Hello. Oh, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. spoken about about a thousand times but going back to the 1973 national what was your th uh, your thought process when you could see red drum coming behind beginning to close the gap what what did you think to try and stay in front well i didn't see him coming because at that stage chris was very tired and you don't look back and unbalance horses but i heard him coming but if i can just take you back a bit further the thought process for the race Chris is a champion at Cheltenham, two mile, the Queen Mother champion two miler. He's now running over four and a half miles and 30 fences with 12 stone on his back. So anyone with brains says, right, you drop him out the back of the 40 runners, switch him off and lob round, keeping stamina. You see, because stamina was going to be the doubt. Few horses stay the trip. You get them now coming off the Anchor Bridge Road, 10 of them there you get to the last fence there's four you get to the elbow there might be two you know it's that extra bit that is so demanding anyway fred winter said look he's such an enthusiastic jumper if we try and hold him up and a hard pulling horse he will jump on the back of something in front of him because a lot of horses all do that you see i mean you can go to the first 40 runners and you've picked your spot that you're going to jump, and all of a sudden, three strides away, psh, horses have gone across you either way. So we agreed that he is so bold, he would have jumped on something's back. And if you don't get round, you can't win. So he said, right, we'll do what Lester Piggott does on the flat. We'll go to the front and slow the race down from the front. And that, and most, in. Yeah, yeah. People follow a senior jockey and think, well, he knows what pace he's going. And, and, you know. So that was the theory. In reality, every time he saw a fence, he went, yeah, woohoo, you know, let's go. He was never running away with me, although people thought you're a brainless and all this sort of thing. I went around the inside, so you're saving lengths in four and a half miles, as it was then. It was his quickening into the fence. Some want to go in and want to jump in. Others are a little bit cagey. He wanted to, so he would quicken going in of his own volition. He would jump absolutely precision over the top of them and be galloping before he hit the ground. So he was making lengths, saving ground on the inside and his jumping. So we got quite clear that way, but everyone thought he was running away. He was never running away. It was just his attributes of jumping. And what a thrill, honey. You know what it's like to go fast at a fence and to fly it. It's, it's great, isn't it? Well, sadly, I've never jumped a fence like that, but hopefully in the future. You will. You will. Anyway, sorry, I, I've interrupted your thought pattern there. Going into the second circuit, he was well clear because the only challenger who'd been on the outside and fairly close, Grace Sombrero, fell. So that left me at the water jump with a circuit to go 20 lengths in front. To go into the second circuit, normally a lot of noise, you know, all the runners around you and blah, blah, blah. it was eerie. There was no sound. And I could see jockeys who'd fallen on the previous circuit standing on the rails, you know. One jockey was holding a bridle. No horse, but he got a bridle. Oh, it was quite, you had so much time to look, you see. And the holes in the fences from disasters. In the and when I got to the beaches the second time, there was a public address in those days because people would, would line the whole place. I could hear Michael O'Hare, the late great commentator, saying, And Dick Pittman and Chris are 25 lengths clear. Red Rum's coming out of the pack, but Fletcher's kicking him along. I thought, that'll do. That's fine. Anyway, by the time I got to Foynaven, the next fence, David Nicholson, the late David Nicholson, was sitting on, I think he rode Barsnet, and it was picking grass. He'd fall and he'd pick grass. He was like an Indian in the old John Wayne films on top of a mountain, watching the cowboys and Indians fighting below. And 
he stood there, he's quite supercilious, and he said, actually, Richard, you're 33 and a half lengths clear, kick on and you'll win. Well, kick on was what I wasn't going to do, because stamina was paramount. And Foynaven is such a long way, it's the 23rd, is it? Yeah, it's a long way from home. Anyway, to cut a long story short from there, by the time we crossed the Anchor Bridge Road and came onto the race course proper, you know, nearly home, I could hear for the first time Red Rum. It was fast ground, so it was drum, 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 drum. And he was a high blower, you know, when he ex exhaled his nostrils flat, so you could hear, <laughs> so it's drum, drum, <laughs> getting louder and louder. And poor old Chris, he went from running away, still going to the second last, to gone. And his legs, which were good moving horse, were start, starting to like swim almost, you know, coming out the side. And the most amazing thing, he had half cocked ears, and even his ears went. Pfft. Now, if you haven't got any strength in your ears, you have gone to the bottom of the barrel, haven't you? Mm. And so I could hear him getting nearer and nearer. Um, I made a big mistake on the run in. I thought I've got to wake him up, and I picked my stick up in my right hand. And he was a big horse, 17-2, very heavy. And once I let go of the reins a bit, changed my head, he fell away. I should have sat and held him, got to the elbow. Anyway, I'd gone off course a bit, pulled him back. I think I lost two and a half lengths, and I'm beaten half a length in the end. But Brian Fletcher was very clever, as jockeys are. Instead of challenging me close up, he went wide. He could see he was picking me off. And he went wide because, as you know, one horse challenged by another, they find a little bit extra. Even if they're dead on their feet, they find extra. So Brian came wide and, uh, you know, it was two strikes on the post that, that he got in front. But incidentally, Peter O'Sullivan, the great commentator, had always agreed to revoice the national if it was ever run on April the 1st. So April Fool's joke, you see, they were going to rerun it and digitally take the winning post back and I was going to win by two lengths. This was a, always a you know, great thing we were to do on the BBC. Anyway, <coughs> it didn't happen. But just recently I've received a photograph where someone has digitally changed, photoshopped, you call it, I suppose, the thing, and I'm a length in front on Chris and there's Red Rum coming at me and there's I the winning that. post oh did you <laughs> yeah that's brilliant isn't it but the answer to you to your original question i've even forgotten what it was but the, the the thinking pattern was to conserve energy from the front rather than conserve it in behind and it didn't work it's funny because every time i watch that bit of footage i know the the outcome but you can't help but get really tense and you're thinking come on come on but I knew the outcome but it's brilliant to watch and that's why I'm so thankful for YouTube because like I said I wasn't alive and yeah so yeah but Hannah isn't it amazing that we're still talking about that race I mean it's because Red Ron went on to win three and essentially saved the Grand National but and therefore Chris Park comes into play but we're still now 47 years later or whatever it is still talking about it you know and he he beat red rum the next season on a level weight match race at doncaster beat him eight or ten lengths but he got a bit of a leg and so fred winter wouldn't take him back to the national because there is you know in those days a fair bit of strain landing over those big fences so it's a pity we never had a chance to to go back but you know it's all in the past isn't it now well, I wanted to ask the difference in the, the Grand National fences then and now, because they were a lot bigger and a lot more dangerous, weren't they? They were. They were bigger, but more than the height, the drop's been taken away at, at Beaches, as you know. You can't take away the turn at the canal turn. And the whole thing is, I'd say a trap, really, but they'd hate that. But it is for horse and rider, because... The third is a big open ditch, a five foot three high. The ditch is four foot wide. The fence is four foot six wide, stands five foot three. So it's a big jump, you know? And so it makes horses sort of go back in the hocks and then you settle down and then you get beaches where it had a big drop. I think it was from the top of the fence to the 
landing on the inside was something like 12 foot nine, something like that, you know. Um, and then when horses have gone plonk uh, and there's no ground there, they go to Foynaven, the smallest on the course, they're expecting another sort of, and yet because it's small, the ground comes up to meet you. And then you go to the canal turn at right angles. If you're near the front, you can go wide and cut across, you know, it's great. And then Valentine's Brook. So that little area is tricky, tricky, tricky. But the other trick that people don't often see if they haven't ridden in it, looking from the stands down to the chair, people say, well, it's, you know, it's, okay, it's narrower on the course, but it doesn't look very big. No, because the ground is raised on the landing side. So you go to the, the chair. Now, luckily, loose horses can go around, but they used to go all over the place. And you've got a big ditch to jump, a big fence, and then the ground is raised. So they're at full stretch and the raised ground comes up to meet them. So it's a tricky, tricky, the, the whole thing is tricky. But the big change was, besides taking away the drop at Beaches, was removing, there were living stakes, sort of six to nine inches, in the ground, in the middle of the fences, and they dress them with, with spruce. Well, now they have removed all of those, because you know, if you got very low, like uh, in eventing, you, you, you hit a fence, and they do a, uh, what is it where you call, uh, you go head over heels anyway, that's what it was doing, you see. But now they have replaced the middle of the fence with plastic, so it will give, mm. you know, they, they and had to, Hannah, they had to change because of public opinion. Yeah. And, and as we old jocks say, oh, well, it's not the same. It had to change. And you've still got to jump 30 fences with 40 horses. So it is a big, big challenge. Um, oh, I love it. I live for it. it. It gives me alive. I mean, I've been involved in the virtual Grand National since it started five years ago. I love it, you know. And last year got 4.8 million viewers because there was no national. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the Derby gets 1.7 or something, you know, and there's, there's the national virtual. And we're going to do it again this year, but we won't get, obviously, on the day. It'll be the Friday nights, you know, yeah. that for a bit of fun. But anyway, it is a great race, isn't it? I, I've raced in the part of Ricci in, in Czechoslovakia, or, uh, the Czech Republic, um, America and place it this is the hardest race there's no doubt about it was there a certain part of the course that you that made you particularly nervous no I was never nervous and funny enough this I'm 78 now and this is the first season I haven't hunted I've still got plenty of go I'm not nervous about anything I'm so excited about it but I'm no stylish and my legs don't work my shoulders fall out you know my body's gone so I have never lost you know, the nerve, but I didn't have much ability when I was riding, I've got even less now, you know, and it's something that you, you can't control. If you do lose your nerve, and I know plenty of people who have, you can't, it's some, you can't say, oh, get over it, you know, because you can't, it's, it's there or it's not. How did you mentally prepare yourself for the national? Because obviously physically you were riding out at the time, but the mental build up, I can imagine was quite intense. Excitement, it's so exciting, you can't wait. And of course the build-up hammer is so long, you know, they come out to the pre-parade ring in good time because of the saddling procedure with so many horses. They then go round and round and big build-up in the parade ring. Then you're getting in front of the stands in a parade in number orders. It takes a while to get 40 horses together, canter down to the first, come back, circle around, or 40 girths have got to be done. And so it's a big, big build up. All you want to do as a jockey is to be legged up and be allowed to do your own thing, you know, because then you are in charge, you know, basically you hope you are. Uh, it's so exciting. And that, that moment, the roar when the start goes up is fantastic. You know, like, like at Cheltenham we'll have very shortly, the first race when they start, although the crowds will be muted, won't they? But that Cheltenham roar, it, it's so, it's fantastic. It's, in, 
enthusiastic. No, I always looked forward to it. Every day got nearer, I was, I was excited. And, and you try and think of the form of other horses, what they'll do, you know? What will they do in the race? Bad jumper, keep out of his way. Brainless jockey, keep out of his way. I lined up once between, <coughs> excuse me, two Americans, brothers, George and Paul Sloan. George came over and was champion amateur with the Giffords one year. And Fred Winter always made me, or asked me to go down the inner, even when I was riding for other people, he'd take me around and he'd say, look, I'll go here, you know, down the inner, brave men, that's where we go. Um, and I lined up one year, I couldn't get the inside veil because there was a gray horse there. So I got second and, and it was the two American brothers. Well, one of them had his horse by the, by the ears, the reins, you know, it, you'd think it was five furlongs and the other was leaning back, you'd think he was having a cigarette, you know, he was so relaxed, the difference between them. So I thought, this isn't a very good place to be. So I've edged out and gone over about five. But of course, all those great cavaliers no longer can, can take part because you have to have ridden so many winners, da -di -da -di -da -di. Uh, I mean, in my day, the Duke of Albuquerque rode five times. Now he was a man, who lived in a castle in Spain and had his own army, like beef eaters with great big pikes and frilly pants and things. He was a huge, wealthy nobleman. And he bred a, he bred a lot, but he bred one and sent it to us at Winters and rode it five times, called Nerio. And, um, <laughs> you know, a man of great importance, a bit like Prince Charles doing it, you see. So he went to, well, I don't know, he, let's say canal turn and he looks like taking ron barry who was a, a champion jockey at the time looks like taking him out and barry shouted over to him what the f are you doing he said i don't know i've never got this far before <laughs> <laughs> and then there was an american called tim durant who rode in it when he was 68 well you wouldn't be allowed to now and he remounted three times in order to complete the course. You allowed to Because you, you can't remount anymore anyway, can you? Back in the day, were you allowed to do that? Yeah, oh yeah. I've got a photograph in a book I wrote years ago, coffee table book, on a mayor called Vikram, who fell at the last at Wing Canton, so far clear, and she's skidded down, you know, and fallen off and I got hold of her. And I wasn't quick enough to jump on her while she was still on the ground, you see. And she got up, stood there, and I couldn't hear another horse coming. But I'd win I'm, a, I'm a little fat fellow, always was. I was winded, you see. So I'm <clears throat> trying to jump up on Vikram while she stood there and said, crying out loud, get on. And uh, it took three jumps before I managed to get on, and it still won. But the crowd were jeering and cheering, come on, jump on, you know. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but I think it's right that you can't remount. You cannot know what damage a horse has done internally. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I've seen a few high profile jockeys because you're so, you know, adrenaline's going. When you jumped up, you could kick on. You, you didn't think that way. But no, I think that is a good move not to, to remount. You know, there's quite a lot of fatalities recently in racing. Is that down to the horse not being ready, but perhaps owners really wanting them to run, do you think? No, I wouldn't have that at all. Horses are more ready now with the all-weather gallops and facilities. You don't get fat horses running, unfit horses. In my day, we got big backward three-year-olds from Ireland, you know. It took three runs for them to know what they were doing, you know. Um, no, I, I don't agree with that, but I can't tell you why. And it couldn't have come at a worse time because come to Cheltenham and Aintree, the antis are glued to use us as a platform for their own ends, you see. I mean, <laughs> Plumpton and, you know, there was one fatality the other day and the race was void. I think it was fatality. Anyway, um, no one takes any notice, which is sad, you know. So the big meetings are very dangerous. I've been instrumental in advising various chairmen, as other jockeys are at Aintree. And one of the things I came up with with the late Rose Patterson, which I think was very valid, 
jockeys are very proud of their record of getting round. You know, I've ridden eight times, got round seven, won it once, got it that day. But it's the end of the four and a half miles. I've seen horses staggering up the run in because people wanted to finish. Even see fairly senior jockeys, very senior jockeys. And I said to Rose Patterson, look, instead of the steward saying to the boys before they go out, go steady boys, four and a half miles to go, you know, public are watching, television all around the world, just go steady, behave yourselves. Well, no one gives a monkey, you know, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. The thing to tell them, and I think Mick Fitzgerald has been put in to, 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 to do this after my suggestion, is to say, look boys, once your horse has gone, don't think of your record of getting round. Think of the horse and the public pull up. And yeah. so we do get a lot more in, a lot of bigger packs of them now, you know, coming up from Valentine's, but it's then the next few fences, if in doubt, pull up. And, and luckily that will save, you know, a few, a few lives. Mm. Especially when you've got all the people watching who are, yeah, yeah. they're just, yeah. Wanting yeah. to go wrong just so they can write millions and millions of articles yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But you know, people are very proud of their records. I mean, Brian Fletcher, for your time, won three, two on Red Rum and one on Red Alligator. But he got round and placed on Eye Catcher. And he was exceptional. Look at Sam Whaley Cohen over the last few years. You know, he he is amazing round there. Uh, so some people attack it better than others or attack is probably the wrong word ride it better than than others but it it is such an exciting thing hey!